Hello, and welcome to the CXUX for Retail Leadership Forum, CX Success 2023. My name is Nick with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have some important information to share with you, and then we will turn the floor over to our esteemed opening keynote speaker. First, we would like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Sprinkler. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. Thanks again to our sponsor, Sprinkler. We also welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please use the hashtag Argyle Digital and follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. Also, be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I would like to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we have curated based on the feedback we have received over the years from our members. We have worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you. So during each session, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box on your screen. Following each presentation, we have set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. Thank you again for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Without further ado, I would like to introduce MQ Qureshi, Head of Digital Product Experience, Clear Choice Dental Implant Centers. We're really excited to have MQ for his opening keynote presentation titled Successful CXUX for Retail Businesses. Welcome, MQ. Over to you. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, welcome to our audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I wish everyone a very happy 2023. Uh, this is a fantastic topic, and I thank, the, uh, I thank the good folks at Argyle for inviting me to share some thoughts with this uh, excellent audience. But we have a lot to cover, so let's jump in. To lay out the agenda, we'll begin with some quick intros on who the Aspen Group is and Clear Choice, for whom I'm privileged to lead digital product experience for, uh, followed by some of my own background. Uh, then we'll examine the central question of today's discussion centered on observations and trends in the market. Uh, and then we'll shift to some guiding principles on how we can approach and win in CX. And finally, I will end with some examples of excellence that I've seen out in the wilderness. So a little on ClearChoice and TAG. ClearChoice uh, Dental Implant Centers is a network of specialty dental centers focused on uh, innovative and quality fixed full arch treatments for patient acro patients across the United States. We have about 80 locations in 45 markets and are growing at a rate of about 12 centers a year and are the category leader of full mouth dental implants. We are part of the Aspen Group, a privately held healthcare company that focuses on bringing better healthcare to more people through a portfolio of companies that include Aspen Dental, well now, which is an urgent care group and chapter, which is a med spa and more. A little on me, uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. I was born in Kenya. Uh, I climbed a volcano at age 11. and <laughs> I came to the United States at the age of 16. I've had about 20 years uh, plus work in digital, working with having the privilege to work with work, some of the world's biggest brands, such as General Motors, Sears, and uh, McDonald's. Uh, I have uh, been a startup founder and uh, have been privileged to win back-to-back uh, -back awards as uh, in top 50 tech visionaries and top 50 tech leaders. Uh, my beautiful wife, Asma, uh, works uh, in healthcare sales and training for GE. And uh, my daughter, Zoya, 13, and Dean, uh, my son, Dean, 11, uh, you know, uh, make me happy and drive me crazy every day. <laughs> also worth mentioning, I was a runner-up for Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award, but I lost out to former Hogwarts professor Gilderoy Lockhart. But I don't talk about that. So let's get into why we're here. I'll start with a quote from Einstein, who said the formulation of a problem is often more essential than its solution, which may be a matter of mathematical or experimental skill. I think John Dewey actually stated a little bit more succinctly, a problem well put is half solved. So let's begin where every problem starts. 
by understanding what we're trying to solve. And let us begin by observing. So what do we think that you know, CX actually is? Well, I'm sure this is not something that anybody in this audience is not aware of, but in general terms, customer experience refers to the interaction between customers and a retail organization or brand. It's pretty simple. But this includes everything from product selection to service delivery to aftercare support, and doesn't just apply to physical locations, but to digital channels, websites, mobile apps, social media platforms, et cetera. I'll tell you one thing, though, that it's not. Next slide, please. It's not just call center operations. Well, not just call center operations. I'm sure some of you share my observation that discussions on CX seems to focus on topics and vendors that stick to these areas, voice tech, chatbots, et cetera. And I'm sure you will agree that it is actually a whole lot more. What I believe it is about is personalization, integrity, expectations, resolution, time and effort, and empathy across all channels. And it's not just me that says this, these are actually KPMG's six pillars of customer experience excellence, because all these period, all these pillars do drive to one thing, the experience. And so before we uh, delve too far, I'm gonna, a quick aside, I'm gonna share a small story. Imagine a younger, hipper, slimmer MQ about 10 or so years ago. He makes his way to the airport, ready to board a flight to his best friend's bachelor weekend in Las Vegas. The airline in question that uh, he gets into won't be named, but there is a popular soccer team in Manchester with which they share a name. He checks in and finds out that he's been upgraded to first class. Fantastic. Wow, this is already going to be a great weekend. And as he's sitting in his seat, he gets a rough tap on the shoulder where a gate agent demands to see his boarding pass. He hands it over and is informed uh, that he needs to leave his seat immediately. And when asking why, he's told another passenger paired for a full fare and therefore he's being downgraded. Now, he takes the, point, the time to point out that while that may be true, he does fly multiple times a week with the airline and has probably spent more than the cost of a single fare with them. And that's likely why he was upgraded in the first place. But the response he's given is that he can take the downgrade or find a different flight. <laughs> well, all eyes on him, he has to leave the first class cabin and make his way to the back of the plane. Needless to say, after that weekend, his loyalty was switched to a different airline. Now, there are several things that went wrong there. And was it completely their fault? Well, hindsight and maturity says to me no. But certainly more empathy could have been shown in that interaction. And what it does show is that ultimately, experience how you make somebody feel, and that experience matters. Next slide, please. Nearly 50% of US customers say they would be less likely to shop due to a poor, poor experience. And that number nearly doubles along, among millennials. And who say that that's probably the top reason they won't return to a particular brand. 80% of customers say that they have backed out of a purchase decision based on a poor experience, and almost 50% say that they would switch to a new brand after a poor experience, 80% saying they would actually go to a direct competitor. Next slide, please. Among that, expectations are rising. 54% of customers have a higher expectations of customer service than they did even a year ago. 84% say that they would expect their problem to be solved quickly. Almost 80% say they would like to be engaged in their preferred channel. Over 50% say their expectations should be met in a completely digital way. And 60% say their most recent experience was not personalized. Over 50% say the necessary information was not provided to them proactively. Now we have to step back from this a little bit and think, why are these expectations so high? Well. And, 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 you know, we're doing everything we can on a day-to-day -day basis to meet these expectations, but why are they getting bigger? Well, the simple truth is it's because your competitors are outpacing you. And you have to ask yourself, does your organization meet these higher expectations or is it even in a position to meet these higher expectations? Next slide, please. And it continues. 81% of CEOs believe that impacts from the pandemic are going to be significant and enduring. And that examples of that include working from home, uh, digital first shopping, 
And, you know, to that point, the world's biggest brands are putting in almost a billion dollars in 2023 alone to focus on better customer experience. 72% of customers say they will only respond to outreach if it's hyper personalized to them. So with all this in mind, how do we take all of this information and think about what approach we might put into place in order to move forward? How do we harness this? How do we take all these facts, the reality of our day-to-day -day business? Well, the truth is, is that we have to shoot for nothing less than excellence. And excellence and experience for retail is a seamless combination of intelligence and interaction, service delivery, service delivery and consistency in the promise. Here's some guiding principles that we can focus on to bring that to life. One, start thinking about total experience. Two, unification. Three, employee empowerment. And four, thinking about hybrid channels. So how do we do this? Well, for one thing, total experience is actually representative of what I believe is an actual mind shift. You have to consider CX as one component only of a total strategy, not just the only component. And you have to apply the principles of total experience to bridge that digital experience gap. Next slide, please. So if we think about going beyond CX and thinking about total experience. What are those things? Well, CX customer experience is really all about how do customers feel? Employee experience. Are our employees happy and do they have the tools that they need to make decisions and drive to better outcomes? User experience tells us where the friction points are and multi-channel experience focus on where our customers more often interact with us and realizing that they're not gonna interact with only one channel. So now we get to an area which I think is incredibly exciting. And this is where I believe some of the future may lie. The general principle about, is about unification of experience, but how do you achieve it? Today, it's done in a very complex way. And the larger that you are, the more siloed you are and the changes across channels is difficult to achieve. And so this idea of composable UX, a construct created by Gardner, aims to simplify that. Composable UX is about modularity, portability and autonomy of the UX layer. According to Gartner, organizations rely on technologies like digital experience platforms to manage and deliver highly relevant, contextualized and seamless digital experiences. But complex, extensive and interconnected technology stacks based on monolithic applications are preventing organizations from delivering truly seamless digital customer experiences across those multi-experience touch points in the customer journey. What is often lacking is the ability to tailor the UX and the user interface, the composable UX as such, to each individual persona based on their roles, as well as the stage and state of their relationship with the organization. Not everybody is going to start at the same place. They may 90% of, you know, 95% of all of our searches start on Google. That's correct. But every customer is not in the same state of mind when they hit your website or they walk into your store. And so when we think about digital, especially, composable UX seeks to provide the user experience that is right for that customer persona for the task they're looking to do at the right stage of their relationship with the organization. Further, Gartner compares today's monolithic experiences against composability and says that monolithic application experiences no longer meet the requirements, expectations, or preferences of innovative business users and their customers. And now, especially if they continuously demand business agility. Now, this is a construct. There's no clear leader yet from what I know at least. And I believe vendors are still absorbing the construct. But technology vendors are progressing slowly towards composable digital experience platforms. And they're unlikely to reach that composable UX um, fluidity and service in the marketplace for at least the next few years. However, make no mistake, if you want to win tomorrow, you have to start today. You have to, and the way to begin is to start architecting towards a composable future. If you want to look into this a little bit more, I came across a very, an excellent article by a gentleman called Jonathan Searing 
And there's a link in this uh, slide deck um, that I believe uh, will be shared out afterwards. So, you know, please do take a look and read about it in a little bit more detail. Really fascinating stuff. But when you think about, you know, how do you go and start to bring all this to life, the next step that you can afford to ignore is around employee empowerment. You have to allow those closest to the customer to have relevant data that they can use to drive to those better outcomes that we seek. Take the example I gave you earlier about the airline. If that airline agent was able to see my history and compare my overall value to the business versus the individual who bought a single ticket, could they have driven to a better outcome? Could they have looked at that and made a contextual decision versus one that was guided by the rules that were being governed to them? How do we enable the removal of friction and inexperience? And that's, I believe, going to be achieved when you put good, when you meet your employees' needs, give them the data that they need, and allow them to drive to those better outcomes. The way to, next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> and the way to embrace this is actually to think about how do you change your organizational structure. What you see on the screen is a, uh, a general construct around a customer journey map. But what tends to happen is that product management tends to be siloed and moves in the swim and is uh, put across all the swim lanes that move horizontally. And what I believe in that when we think about changing that organizational structure is that we have to think about product management not living in swim lanes, but living across the entire journey. And, and when you start to do that, you start to then think about, well, okay, what are all the things that power that customer journey? And when you remove those organizational silos, you can start thinking about product management as a center of excellence and focus them on solving problems across that multi-channel journey and not limit it to a set of individual silos or channels. Next slide, please. And finally, we have to realize is that our customers don't live on one channel alone. Any kind of retail lives both online and offline. And so when you think about those things, we have to think about what those customer profiles are across channels. Often because things is, are so siloed, we tend to look at things in only one channel without looking at the overall context. So we have to find the ways where we can identify people in the accounts across those different digital assets, match those anonymous and use na names to name pro uh, users to name profiles. And by monitoring digital and offline behavior, you can start to then better understand each client's interests and intent. We have to think about instant optimization real-time segmentation to identify and provide contextually relevant experiences that motivate your customers to act. Remember that not everybody is going to be thinking about the same things at the same time. And then we have to think about cross-channel segmentations. They're critical micro moments in the customer's journey. And if you can offer the appropriate good services and knowledge or knowledge or experience at this moment, you win. And so the thought is, and this is where that thought of composable UX comes in. How do we create individual components that can be reused across channels and provide the same set of data so that we can react to it and make better decisions? And so, you know, I love this quote from Will Durant. It says, we are what we repeatedly do. And excellence is not an act, but a habit. So how do we bring all of it together? Well, that's for all of us to individually decide. All of our organizations are different with different challenges. But when we take that philosophy of mind, when we think about mind shifting to total experience, when excellence becomes a habit, when employees are empowered, when you know your customers, when you understand their journey, well, that's when brilliant, brilliance comes about, and sometimes unexpectedly. Here's some examples of brilliance that I've seen out in the wild. I'll start with a high-end Dutch bicycle manufacturer called Van Moof. It's a company that committed to achieving a 90% online sales goal and found that a majority of their high-end bikes that people were spending thousands of dollars on were unfortunately arriving damaged to their customers. Lost in shipping, moved around, battered around, they would often come in with key components broken. Well, a member of their design team decided that they're going to um, try and solve for this. And so what did they do? Next slide, please. It was a very simple solution to a complex problem. They put an image of a flat screen TV and printed it on the side of their boxes. 
And what they found was that 70 to 80% reduction in shipping damage took place. My next example is one with a very storied brand, Coca-Cola. And this is an example of brand resonance. Coca-Cola in the country of Pakistan lagged behind Pepsi very heavily in terms of market share. Well, their head of marketing at the time, a gentleman called Nadim Zaman, saw a one-off music event held by Coke in Brazil, decided to bring that to his market. But what they did differently from others was that they used extensive customer research and testing. What they realized is, is that the buyers of tomorrow are actually the pre-teens and early teens of today. And so they spent a lot of time talking to these individuals about what they wanted to see and realized that music not only broke barriers, but also that the, those individuals wanted modern techniques, but stayed true to regional tastes and local artists. Well, they started a, a YouTube channel called Coke Studio. That is now in its 14th season. And what we've seen, next slide, please, is that not only has this become a global phenomenon where Coke has embraced this on a global basis, but that resonance felt so true and underlined in the promise of Coca-Cola as being a true brand that it created this global phenomenon with a brand that had deep felt resonance and loyalty and allowed Coke to take over market share in that country alone. My final example is on how to turn a frown upside down. This is an example of customer service and social listening. A UK retailer called Morrison's mistakenly marked down a bottle of Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve down to two pounds and 50 cents. A customer sees in that moment and ordered 10 bottles only to be left high and dry when his order was canceled. Well, Glenn Livid learned about this when the man posted his story on Reddit. They didn't know who he was, so they ran a full page ad to find him and apologize. Here's what it read. Next, uh, next slide, please. Dear Anthony Silson, we're sorry. How could anyone do so much wrong to someone who does so much right? On Wednesday, June 15th, Morrison Supermarket sold bottles of the Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve for just £2.50, a saving of 93%. Anthony, you seized the opportunity not just once, but purchased 10 bottles of the Glenlivet to gift as future birthday presents and Christmas presents. Greedy, maybe. Clever, yes. Generous, most certainly. So the suffering you must have felt then when Morrison's retracted your click and collect the horror that raced through your body as your basket emptied, unimaginable. Weekend plans, sipping single malt and getting your freak on in a yurt in the Lake District, thwarted at the hands of William Morrison. Is there no mercy? You are a fine man. We are a fine whiskey. It's only right we should be together at any cost. So please, Anthony Silson, accept our apology and enjoy 10 bottles of the Caribbean Reserve on the house. Yours truly, the Glenlivet. I don't know about you, but I, when I saw that, I went out and bought a, a bottle just for myself. So with that, that's all I have today. Um, and, uh, you know, if you enjoyed what you heard, uh, please uh, follow me on LinkedIn uh, and look out for a book project that should be coming out later this year where other stories of unexpected brilliance and how to harness excellence all around you will be featured. Thank you. Thank you, MQ. Uh, we have a little bit of time if you want to answer any of the questions, but if we don't have time, totally understood. Um, sure. Yeah, they're right in the chat there. All right, I'm taking a look. So uh, first one I see is how can we convey to upper management that customer satisfaction is key to our company's success? You know, you're, this, is a, this is a great question. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, information around CSAT and NPS scores, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, you know, and, and there's a lot of data that you can find to back that up. But at the end of the day, the fact is, is that, you know, um, we have to uh, start looking at how to gather data across all points of that journey. Now, um, if your management team is not quite ready yet, I, there's a, a certainly a, a certain a, a lot of um, publicly available data um, that can be shared. Uh, I cited Gartner here. I cited Salesforce and others um, that could be that could be shared with them. Uh, but it's a great uh, a point that isn't be, uh, worked off of just one point. So I would say that uh, my answer is very high level. Let's you know if you want to connect with me afterwards, I'd love to discuss that with you. Um, 
Question two, how do you balance digitization experience investments against the touch retail environment that businesses and consumers are facing? Uh, so I'm not quite sure I understand that, 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 that question in total. Um, I would say that, you know, when it comes to it, yeah, a lot of times digital channels are, are kind of left by the wayside because they seem to operate fairly well and there's a stability to them to a certain extent. So that immediacy that you see in a retail environment in an in-store experience may not necessarily be seen when you are looking at data in total because you can't necessarily break down in real time what some of that uh, experience is on, on the digital side. You, because you have to look at that 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 uh, data with a lot more context in mind. However, what I would say is that if you are not again thinking about total experience, you have to think about all of those different components together. Then what you're going to do is maybe you'll be in a situation. Unfortunately, Southwest found itself in where they didn't update their digital infrastructure, and a perfect storm came along and. You can probably use that to to uh, uh, incite some some interest from upper management on uh, on on why there's a great case for updating your infrastructure. Uh, question three: How do you train every employee to understand that they are a customer service representative and understand the total experience picture? You know, um, I would say that on on this one, you first have to develop that total experience picture. You know, uh, uh, oftentimes journeys and total experience uh, uh, maps are individual exercises that are done for the sake of a particular start and stop project. This is where the mind shift of the organization has to shift and we have to live by what that total experience picture is. So start by developing it and putting it down and then think about how do you bring it to life and actually make it something that's a living construct that everybody can go with. That I think does a really good job of one, putting a lot of things in context. And then two, from a, a, a customer service representative standpoint, uh, provides more data for them that they can look at and go, oh, okay, now I understand what's happening in other channels. Third, you have to look at the infrastructure that you provide and the data that you're providing to that customer service representative. Oftentimes, these individuals are not given enough support and have to make decisions that are not um, uh, that are without that context. So when you build that map, start thinking about what are the channels that you can use to drive better data to them so they can get to better outcomes. Uh, four, when empowering employees, they need to balance the request of the full ticket paid customer and loyal customers with experience on the total experience overlap. How do you handle the empathy to up want to upgrade everyone to first class? <laughs> yeah, no, this is true. You know, I would say that... Um, um, you know, and, and that's, and, and that's where, again, the, in that particular case, yeah, in the moment, it didn't feel great, you know, but I also look back on it and realize that that employee probably could have shown a lot more empathy in terms of just explaining the situation and appealing to my empathy, as opposed to, you know, rudely saying, get in the back of the plane, or you're, you're you have to fight a different flight. So that there, there, there's, empath there's an empathetic training that I think is involved there where you know um that that goes part you know that goes hand in hand with good customer service however um i think also providing uh, creating rules that uh, that that uh, uh allow customer service agents to reward loyalty versus short term gains also goes a long way in terms of being able to find affinity, uh, find uh, loyalty to your brand uh, five, have online physical presence is not feasible for many retailers. What recommendations do you have for online only businesses? Well, it actually simplifies it quite a bit because when you have both online and offline operations that you have to deal with, you have to um, uh, balance the needs of both. And sometimes um, because traditionally your offline has been more traffic, that tends to get a lot more uh, focus. However, what we've seen from some of the trends that I shared is that we have a lot more um, uh, online retailing going on. And so uh, think about, again, that total experience map. Um, I think we're we're at the end. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, MQ, for an excellent keynote. Um, and I also want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thanks, everybody.